Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're all well. Um, thank you all for joining us from your various locations, whether you're tuned in from Fiji, the Pacific region, or around the world. Your time is valuable, and uh, we thank you for choosing to spend it here with us this afternoon. Now, on behalf of International Ideas Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, I'd like to welcome you all to the third webinar of the Democratic Development in Melanesia uh, webinar series for 2023. We would also like to welcome our panelists and to you as well, our participants. Now, as part of International Ideas Asia and the Pacific Regional Programs Work Plan for 2023, these we webinars aim to provide opportunities to citizens of the Melanesian region to take part in substantive discussions surrounding democracy in Melanesia. Also intended that through the webinar, citizens of Melanesian countries who participate may gain knowledge on the subject matter and on the experiences of other countries. This will in turn enhance debates on institutional and procedural improvements in their respective democracies. Now this third webinar titled Democratic Development in Melanesian Webinar Series, Citizens Watching Parliament. Now democracy is receding in Asia and the Pacific while authoritarianism solidifies only 54% of people in the region live in a democracy and almost 85% of those live in one that is weak or backsliding. Even high and mid-performing democracies such as Australia, Japan and Taiwan are suffering democratic erosion. Although highly diverse, common elements erode democracy are inter alia, rising ethno-nationalism, military intervention in political processes, patronage politics and executive aggrandizement. This negative trend is tearing the social contract apart in many countries with a demand for increased accountability and an overhaul of the political system in countries as varied as Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. The Melanesian region in the Pacific has its own share of democratic erosion. Populist movements have gained traction by attacking democratic institutions and norms and the prevalence of fake news and digital disinformation has created a need for citizens to act as counterbalance to these trends. Watching Parliament gives citizens a chance to see their representatives in action and understand how decisions are made. It also provides an opportunity for citizens to voice their concerns and opinions on issues that affect them directly. This feedback can help shape policy decisions and ensure that the government is working towards the betterment of society. Now, before we jump into our webinar today, just a few house rules. This webinar will have three speakers who will deliver their presentation first, and then the audience will have 30 minutes after the speakers have presented to ask their questions. Now, the audience is reminded, our participants, that's that being you, are reminded that you can use the raise hand feature to ask questions. You can also, uh, you can also post your questions in the chat feature. We'd also like to remind you to please keep your mic off during the webinar and to only turn it on when it comes to asking questions during the Q&A section. Now, before we proceed any further, please note that this session is being recorded. I also have a disclaimer from International IDEA. The statements, views, or opinions expressed in the presentation do not necessarily represent the institutional position of International IDEA, its board of advisors, or its Council of Member States. Now, if you haven't already done so, I'd like to humbly request that everyone please put their mics on mute as I introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker for today is Mr. James Khan. Mr. Khan is currently serving as the Vice President of Citizens Congress Watch, or CCW, a parliamentary monitor, monitoring organization with a strong focus on legislative transparency and accountability, CCW is dedicated to promoting ethical practices and integrity among parliamentarians in the Taiwan legislative win. Mr. Khan, or James, has been actively involved in overseeing the internal evaluation of parliamentarians within CCW, ensuring that they uphold the highest standards of performance. Due to his extensive knowledge of the Taiwan Legislative Yuan, he's also served as a private counsel for the revamping of the Legislative Yuan website. In recent years, he's represented the organization in implementing 
Taiwan's first open parliament action plan under the principles of, of uh, the Open Government Partnership, or OGP. Furthermore, James has actively engaged in international collaborations, aiming to strengthen connections and foster knowledge sharing among oversight organizations in Asia. With a master's degree in political science from Su Chao University and prior experience as a project researcher for the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, he has conducted research in Taiwan's democratic resilience and parliamentary dynamics. His participation as an international election observer for the Asian Network for Free Elections has provided James with valuable insights into electoral processes across the Asia region. By, combi by combining his expertise in parliamentary monitoring and commitment to democratic principle, he strives to contribute to the advancement of transparent and accountable governance. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker for this webinar this afternoon, Mr. James Khan. Thank you, Amelia. And it's a very honor to be invited to have this chance to share our working to the Melanesia friends. So first things I want to share my screen uh, with me for two seconds. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Okay. So my name is James Ken. Thank you all again to join this webinar with me. Uh, I'm representing the Citizen Congress Watch, and we are the Taiwan organizations. Of course, we are non-government organizations, and that started our intro. So CCW was founded in 2007. Uh, we composed with 48 organizations. All of them are NGOs and or MPOs. The goals are to oversee the Congress, the parliament, which is our legislative UN, eliminate inadequate MPs and improve Congress cultures. And we also urge our parliament to be more uh, serving public, more welfare, more transparency, more efficiency, and more integrity. So why we stop establish CCW was the background. So 2007, 15 years ago, Taiwan's legislative union was uh, characterized by the lack of accountability and transparency. The candidates, before they become the MP, they made a numerous promise before the elections. But once it's a very common sense, those promises seem to vanish. They didn't do any, anything after they be elected. So most of the MPs, they skip the meeting. They, go, they don't go to the parliaments. And the lack of the oversight of the national budget, this is their duty, but they didn't go to deliberations. And the uh, versions of the law, the bill that was passed was controlled by the small group of the whips. Also, the general public had limited understanding of the discussions during the parliaments. So at that time, there was no live broadcasts and the release of written records was significantly delayed. More than three months or six months, we can see the outcome of the records. So actually the whole entire legislative process seems like a black box, lacking of transparency and public scrutiny. So how do we face that background? So CCW's founding fathers, most of them are scholar or professor in the, uh, in the school. So we have a test for the student. Why don't we using evaluation as a means to achieve the goal of monitoring our parliament? So we use the evaluation systems. It's very easily and can quickly draw the attention of the general public and the members of parliament. We will award those MPs who perform as well with the parliament, and we will give that outstanding MPs award. For those who do not perform as that well, let's give the meeting or never deliberations, uh, we will give them the label. We won't say they are bad. Instead, we will say they are under observations. So make sure every public can watch them then carefully next session. So we'll, I will introduce our evaluation indicators, but it's 
more than 51 right now, 51 indicators. So it's a just briefly introductions. So if you are interested, let's schedule. So we can have a one-on-one -on -one explanations. And also there's a QR code. It's our official website for CCW. You can see uh, more data, uh, every indicators, every outcomes right now, you can see in our website. So I give you three seconds. You can use your cell phone to scan this QR code. One, two, three. Okay, I'll go to the next page. So this is our evaluation indicators. So the basic performance, you have to go to the general assembly or the committee. This is attendance, but the attendance actually is not meaning so much. So we just give them a proportion, only 10%. Why? Because they can sign the name and then go. They don't have to stay in the parliament. After they sign, they can go back to their home, back to their office and don't deliberations. So we're more focused on their committee performance because committee is the most spending time in deliberations of the budget and the bill. So in committee deliberations, we give them 20%, bill budget deliberation also 20%, and also the bill, how much primary st statutory bills they have posed and how did they do some budget cut or freeze? Because this is the duty to watch the national budgets, but it must be reasonable. They cannot just say, oh, I, I don't like this government, this department, so I cut their budget. They have some reasonable, so they can have this scored. So basic performance, we have 100. And there's a citizen evaluation of the inquiring performance. We will invite the citizens to give their, uh, their, uh, their MPs when they are inquiring or a question to the government, they can give them grades. We have four indicators, performer, uh, professional, value positions, problem solving skill, and their attitude. So this is 20%. So you can see the basic plus the, the citizen evaluation is 100. So those on the list in still observe, that means they are fell of here. 100 score less than 60. That means they are fell by this score. So we will give them the, uh, the outcome is still be observed. Also, we have another bonus indicators. Is their information disclosed by themselves? Because some of the information we cannot see in our website in the legislative end, like benefit of voice, uh, employment of the assistants, what, how many assistants they have, uh, is there any related by themselves? I mean, okay, so another is, is their proposal of the act is public interest? or righteousness. If they do so, we will give them extra points. About the budget, did they did a good job at the budget? And did they have any special deeds? We will give the extra point also. So there's another uh, indicators for the bonus. Also, if they doing something wrong, we can minus them. So in this part, when the bill or the budget proposal have been checked is violation of the basic human rights or a major public interest, we will give them minus. Of course, if there have some uh, litigation cases, it may be uh, being causes. So also appropriated behavior inside or outside the legislative yen. Like, I don't know, have you heard that Taiwan's uh, MPs, they are very easily to fight each other, to throw something in, in, the, in the meetings. So that kind of things happen, we will minus their grade. So this is a uh, very briefly introducing about our indicators. So did it really have any impact on our parliament? You can see this is the data graph of attendance and interpolations every session. 
since we have the evaluation start. So this is the seven, con uh, seven parliament, one sessions is the first time we started to evaluations. I always say that most of them, they will come and sign their name. That means they have attendance, but they didn't do any deliberations or stay in the parliaments for working, for meeting. They just sign and go. So you can see most of the sessions, the uh, attendance rate is more than 90 average. But you can see the interpolation rates, only 44% when we saw in the first time we have an evaluation. So in the seven parliament, it's about 50 to 60. But after election, because we have the name list of watching list and we urge the people don't vote to that MPs don't come to work and vote to the MPs we uh, have give them the, uh, the award. So some of them did a good job. They cannot re-election again. So in the eight parliament, it's about 60 to 70%. Once again, there is another election. We do the same things in the ninth parliament. You can see there's a big improvement. It's more than 90% some of them, but okay, still another election come. Right now it's the 10 parliament. You can see that most of the MPs, they have to interpolations. It's more than 90. Why? Because they know there's organizations where are monitoring them, we're watching them, not only signatures, they have to perform us questions, do deliberations, that means they know someone's watching them. Someone will helping the public to overcome or just oversize them, watching them. Okay, this is the outstanding legislator. We will have a ceremony, give them rewards. And this is a campaign banner. When they got the awards, they what you see in the next elections. So this is the legislator, um, MPs, they're running elections. They will say, oh, they're the outstanding uh, MPs reward by CCW. This is another example. This is also, and this one, they, uh, he says, he constituents should take the outstanding, uh, outstanding MPs from CCW. Actually, it's work for them <clears throat> when they're campaign. So they were, they were urging or they were happy to get this reward by CCW. So what I want to talk about is, yes, democracy is very important, but it's not just about voting on election day, but about fulfilling civic responsibility every day. So of course the voting process is very crucial. This is a fundament of the democracy system. But what happens after voting? Can we keep account that MPs or the politicians, more accountability, more integrity, we cannot just in the process of the voting. After voting, it's time to start the work of overseeing the parliament, make them responsible, make them accountability. So to continuously achieve this goal, we are not only use the evaluations, we do something else. We will have the press conference urging like this one is no delay of the national budget deliberations. Also, we will visiting their chairman of the legislative UN to promote the transparency and citizen participations. <clears throat> also, we do the agenda forecast weekly because the agenda already opened, but it's very hard to see or it's very hard to understand. So we will translate to more friendly uh, topic or friendly words to the public, then uh, they can understand what is the agenda schedule next week. Also, we do the education promotions. We go to the university, to teach them what is important to monitoring the Congress or the parliaments, uh, how they can monitor it, how they can do that. 
And also you can see that there is a student playing the board game. What's this board game? Actually, we developed this due to the uh, complicated about the legislative process. It's very hard to understand what's situation right now in the parliament. So we use this uh, board game to help assist the students understanding the procedures of the uh, legislative process. And participants can get a better understanding by playing this board game. Also, uh, not only doing domestic, we want to do more international organizations, collaborations. So what is PMO? Actually, PMO is Parliamentary Monitoring Organizations, we call PMO. So this year, just for this year, in the March, we host the International Forum. Actually, it's co-hosted with the NDI and WFD. So we invite seven PMOs from around the world to Taiwan, share their experience. And this early June, we signed an MOU with the Japanese PMO group. Uh, they call the Japanese Banlim Yaptong to initiate the establishment of the Asian network. But because today, I think it's not only the Asians, we can go to the Pacific regions. So after my speech today, I hope there is someone or some organizations are have interesting, willing to join us this network, collaborate with us. So this is the March 14 to 15, we sign uh, declarations. You can see the represent from Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Argentina, and Kosovo. This is the Japan's uh, PMO by name Yapdong. They come to Taiwan, sign MOU with us. So this is my end of the presentation. True democracy begins after vote are cased. We understand voting process is very important. So we also monitoring the election day, do some research, but that's only one day or one month during the whole terms of our MPs. After voting, we need to keep watching them, keep that them more accountability, more integrity. That is what the true democracy. Thank you very much, I was sure to hear. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan, for that insightful presentation. I know that I wasn't the only one who enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, now, I can appreciate that there may be a few of you who have questions, but as mentioned before, we'll address these after all three of our speakers have presented. Now, in the meantime, you may go ahead and pose these questions in the chat feature if you haven't already done so. And we'll address these later on in the webinar. Now from Taiwan, we head to Fiji for our second speaker, Ms. Lucia Langilevu. Ms. Langilevu graduated from the University of the South Pacific in 2014 with a Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Arts majoring in journalism. She joined Pashatam Lawyers in 2015 before joining the Citizens Constitutional Forum in 2018 as a policy and research officer. One year later, she became their program manager, a role that she has flourished in to date. And it's no wonder she has a passion for international law, human rights, democracy, and development work. And as such has received training on human rights standards, instruments, mechanisms, and frameworks that are available internationally and locally. She's contributed to national submissions on legislative reforms, reflecting on good governance principles and democratic processes, and values of monitoring and evaluating the impact of human rights activities, public participation, and policy development. While working for CCF, she's been involved in the program design of project activities focused on supporting democratic processes and civic engagement. In particular, being the conceptualization of activities within CCF's parliamentary support project, particularly in the capacity building of communities on parliamentary engagement advocacy and civic education. She has also been heavily involved in carrying out CCF's trainings and workshops on parliamentary processes, human rights, constitution, freedom of speech, UN Universal Periodic Review Framework, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is just to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure in introducing our second speaker for today, Ms. Lucia Langilevo. 
Bulovinaka uh, to uh, everyone uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to take this moment to thank um, International IDEA uh, for this uh, much needed webinar. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge our colleagues uh, on the uh, panel. Uh, to start off, I'd like to just um, state a disclaimer as well from CCF. So the information that we're about to share is information shared in the context of parliamentary engagements and processes prior to the 2022 elections. Uh, now, a little bit about the Citizens Constitutional Forum. We are a non-governmental organization locally based in Suva, Fiji. Uh, the CCF has more than 20 years of experience in community education and advocacy on Fiji's constitution, democracy, human rights, and multiculturalism. Uh, we work locally uh, as well as regionally and internationally with our partners to amplify uh, the protection of human rights, um, the rule of law and democratic processes. CCF is not aligned with any political party. Um, now, when I, uh, when CCF was uh, prompted on this webinar, um, we, we understood that our role in this webinar would be to um, talk a bit more on our, um, our parliament project um, that was supported by the United Nations Development Program. Uh, we were able to carry out this project with the purpose of expanding parliament outreach and citizen engagement. Um, we had two significant roles in this uh, project. The first being uh, information aggregation and dissemination, uh, which is simply uh, sharing information uh, with, this, with citizens of Fiji, as well as uh, members of civil society organizations. The second role was to, um, to help or to support citizen engagement uh, with parliamentary processes. And we're really thankful to the United Nations Development Program for enabling uh, this, um, this important project in Fiji. I'd also like to share some of the highlights of that project. Um, also, uh, uh, apologies, I, I am not sharing a PowerPoint slide because uh, um, I'd like to, um, to, to have a direct engagement with the, the participants. Um, however, if you would like more information on information that I'm sharing here, please feel free to uh, contact uh, CCF. So back to the highlights of the Parliament project. Um, we carried out certain activities under this project. Uh, first, one of the activities was the parliamentary engagement advocacy and civic education. We had this um, done through divisional workshops around Fiji, uh, we had four divisional workshops, um, which focused on members of the civil society organizations, as well as um, uh, members of marginalized communities, youths, uh, women, uh, persons living with disabilities. And we looked at um, sessions on how parliament works uh, parliamentary standing committees, successful legislative reform purposes, uh, processes, budget cycles. When we were looking at budget cycles, we, uh, we shared information on the frameworks, processes, and institutions involved in the budget cycle in Fiji. Uh, we also um, had sessions on drafting budget submissions. And just on these workshops, we were able to have participants um, draft their budget submissions, uh, which were then submitted to the budget division of the then Ministry of Economy, which is now known as the Ministry of Finance. 
Um, we were also able to contribute to the maritime travelers' rights submission in Fiji. Um, and so uh, these workshops helped uh, the participants become more aware of the parliamentary uh, processes, um, as well as getting to understand why citizens need to uh, need to um, need to be aware of these parliamentary processes and where exactly they can engage as citizens with their elected uh, representatives in parliament. Um, we had about 117 participants in total uh, that participated in this, um, this civic education workshop alone. Uh, apart from the workshops, we also had advocacy materials. So um, the advocacy materials included information, um, general information on parliamentary processes, such as um, how laws are made, uh, parliamentary standing committees, what are standing orders, uh, because we hear so much about parliamentary standing orders uh, on TV and, you know, the, the parliament coverages uh, that are aired live uh, on social media as well as, as well as uh, Wallisi. Um, and so uh, it was important for us to, to give a bit more uh, friendly, detailed information about these, um, these parliamentary information. We also um, made infographics on parli the parliamentary cal calendar through uh, bookmarks, uh, and these were shared with our participants. Um, another highlight of the project was the dissemination of parliamentary information. So quite apart from the advocacy materials, we were also able to uh, share order papers uh, for uh, parliamentary, um, uh, parliamentary seatings. So when these were communicated to us by parliament, uh, we would share this with our network and then our networks were encouraged to share that uh, to their own networks. Um, and we saw this as an important um, measure because not everyone, uh, not everyone receives the order papers. Um, not everyone is focused on uh, on social media in terms of the information given out on parliamentary uh, processes. So, you know, that was just an additional way of sharing what was going on on parliament. Uh, the, Another aspect to dissemination or sharing of parliamentary um, information were the budget processes. So with the support of UNDP through this project, we were able to put out a information, um, uh, information uh, sheet on the national budget process and why it was important uh, for citizens to and where citizens could engage. You know, basically just giving them a picture of how the whole budget cycle works um, every year. We also, um, we also faced a few challenges while we were monitoring parliament. Uh, because of the nature of the work that CCF does, um, apart from sharing information on parliamentary processes, CCF is also uh, monitoring on how parliament performs and whether it is in line with democratic processes, whether it does protect human rights uh, and follows a uh, rule of law. Um, so some of the, um, some of the uh, challenges we faced in the project was uh, were concerns raised by some civil society organizations on our advocacy and parliamentary engagement. Um, one of the reasons, and it, it's important, we believe that it's important to understand the concerns that are raised by uh, civil society in, in terms of parliamentary engagement. Uh, so for us, uh, some of the concerns raised by CSOs um, were to do with how there was a gap uh, between the parliament um, and members of the public or civil society organizations. Um, 
And just to remind our viewers, our audience today that I'm, I'm speaking on engagements with uh, parliament before the 2022 uh, general elections. Um, the concerns raised uh, were on the note that it was this, you know, civil society organizations um, received discouraging responses by the former Fiji government. Uh, whenever they would lobby and advocate on matters affecting communities and citizens. And um, these were very prominent during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic through the first and second waves in Fiji. Uh, so with that experience, the concerns came up that um, questioning uh, the, um, uh, the essence of this project. Um, but CCF was able to, uh, to carry on with the project and uh, was also able to liaise with our partners in terms of the significance of this project, uh, especially that it was important for the people that we serve to understand the uh, processes of parliament. Um, another challenge that we faced with um, monitoring parliament was the developing political context in Fiji. Um, it, was, it was something that CCF had to consider uh, while carrying out activities under this project, as well as while planning uh, these activities, uh, mainly because we'd have, to, um, we'd have to understand the developing context, as well as inform the participants or the target groups of this project on um, how well they can best engage um, their par um, parliamentary members uh, through, you know, through, um, through developing political context. Another challenge that we faced was the impact of COVID-19. Because the project was implemented from 2020, until uh, 20, the end of 2021, um, those two years were very um, critical in Fiji because we had undergone the underwent Fiji underwent the first and second wave of COVID-19. Uh, it did have some major uh, impact on our activities, especially uh, with our parliamentary ex excursions. Uh, we had hoped to carry out these excursions. Um, and other activities, but because of the pandemic, the impact, as well as the uh, protocols that we had to respect, uh, we were not able to carry out some of these uh, in-person or face-to-face -face, uh, activities. Um, but regardless of those, we were able to adapt. So, you know, something that CCF thrives on is being adaptive uh, whenever we're met with challenges. And so again, with the support of UNDP, we were able to um, we were able to carry out other activities in place of the uh, Parliament excursions. Um, another challenge I'd like to share as well, while we, we while we were carrying out this project, um, was in terms of uh, carrying out the. Uh, civic education bit. Uh, because the project went on from uh, 2020 to uh, 2021, uh, there were times when there were uh, curfews as well as uh, containment areas to protect people from the spread of the pandemic. Uh, so CCF waited out those periods and when it was safe for the organization to continue carrying out civic education, uh, we were able to do so with the support of UNDP. Now, some of the um, key messages um, we were able to share, how, how CCF was able to um, share key messages um, to citizens. We were able to do these through infographics. Uh, I've, I believe I've shared this before, infographics on parliamentary processes budget processes, um, how laws are made, 
uh, we were also able to carry out uh, short interviews, short videos of our participants from the uh, parliamentary engagement workshops. Uh, and much of this, uh, many of these uh, short videos captured how much our participants, um, how much our participants uh, found it uh, important to, um, to be taught about parliamentary processes, to know about where citizens can engage, uh, because it was something they were able to take back to their communities. Um, and because of that, we CCF continued um, to receive requests from communities to, um, to carry out these curriculums, to carry out these workshops in their, um, in their own communities. Uh, and we hope to, to continue this work uh, with some support. Uh, we were also able to share key messages on parliamentary processes through, um, through other CCF events and activities, even though, um, even though we were not, uh, even though the activities weren't from this uh, parliament project support, um, parliament support project, sorry. Um, we intentionally um, shared these uh, information on parliamentary processes with participants of other events. Uh, it is, we found it important uh, to continue sharing this in, uh, information on parliamentary process and engagements in our other projects, in our other activities, uh, because there is a great need by our citizens to understand these processes um, one of, um, I'll give an example. Uh, some of our participants um, indicated that they were not aware um, that they were, they were able to uh, send an open letter to parliament highlighting their, um, their challenges or their issues in parliament. Uh, you know, simple avenues such as those uh, were not known by, uh, by our participants who are members of the public. Uh, and it just tells us uh, how much is not known by our communities. It just tells us how much more work is needed uh, in Fiji. And we hope um, that our, um, our partner CSOs and other uh, CSOs out there uh, would be able to continue in sharing um, these educational information on parliamentary processes so that we're able to increase uh, and strengthen uh, public participation um, in policy uh, making decisions, as well as in parliamentary processes. Um, one of the, one of the um, questions we were also asked to present on was how does CCF raise concerns on the parliament actions? Um, I think I, I believe I had also mentioned this previously, uh, the nature of uh, CCF and the work that we do in terms of monitoring uh, parliamentary, um, our parliamentary leaders and the processes. Um, it's sort of contradictory to uh, the, the, the project that we had carried out uh, under the parliamentary support project. But, um, you know, as I have said initially, we are not aligned to any political party. So, uh, and because of the mandate that CCF carries, we continued with our, um, with raising concerns on parliamentary actions. So some of the ways that we continued to raise concerns on parliamentary actions uh, was engaging through parliamentary standing committees. So CCF, uh, we echo issues raised with us by our communities as well as uh, through research um, through to the parliamentary standing committees um, when there's a call for public consultations on uh, a review of an existing law or a particular bill um, that's uh, concerning an entirely new uh, uh, piece of legislation. We also participate in ministerial public consultations. Um, it, 
takes the uh, it takes the same form as uh, engaging with parliamentary standing committees, but in this case, it's with uh, separate ministries. We also uh, engage in collective advocacy measures, and this is through our networks and alliances, such as the NGO Coalition for Human Rights, the uh, CSO Alliance for COVID-19 Humanitarian Support, and the Universal Periodic Review CSO Working Group. So through these networks, we are able to continuously raise our concerns um, and advocate on uh, improving parliament actions. And that brings me to the end of my information sharing on CCF's work with parliamentary uh, process, the NACA. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kalani Lebu. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation, but also for the work that you've done and that um, you continue to do. We're very appreciative, the NACA. I'd like to take this opportunity to re-remind everyone that if you have questions, you may post these questions um, in the chat feature, which will, which will be addressed later on in the webinar. Now, last but certainly not least, our third and final speaker for today, Mr. William Nasak. Mr. Nasak is the current chairman of the Vanuatu Association for the Non-Government Organization. In March, he was elected as chairman of the National Human Rights Council for Vanuatu. And in 2016, he completed his contract as the director general of the Ministry of Youth Development, Sports and Training. Prior to that, he was the Director General for the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Livestock and Biosecurity for the first two years of his contract. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge in both the government and NGO um, space, and we look forward to hearing his thoughts on democratic development in Melanesia, specifically citizens watching parliament. Mr. Nasak, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I want to. I would like to acknowledge the um, two previous speaker. I think um, from James Ken and uh, the one recently. I think um, their their experience has been very valuable. I think, um, especially monitoring the uh, parliamentarians and. What happens in Parliament? I think Vanuatu can actually learn a lot. I have a presentation which I, I slide which I want. Uh, just give me a second while I try to uh, get it on board. Uh, Mr. William, do you want me to share your presentation? Uh, yes, please. I think I got the wrong thing on board. Okay, could you just stop sharing and just let me look for that presentation? Okay. Okay, thank you uh, very much. I think um, with this uh, presentation, I think I just want to say that um, Van Gogh hasn't, um, hasn't been very active in um, uh, its um, duties um, in the recent past. I think Van Gogh has gone through a lot uh, in trying to reorganize itself. And uh, what has happened is that um, uh, uh, in my two years as being the chairman of Van Gogh, 
it has been basically to actually strengthen the internal structure of uh, Van Gogh. And I am proud to say that uh, uh, we will be launching our strategic plan soon, which is in the uh, 2nd of August. And that would actually show the government and as the donors and other organizations in Vanuatu, the direction that actually Van Gogh actually wants to take. And one uh, particular thing that I'm proud to say is that um, within our strategic plan is to look at how we can hold the government more accountable for the budget that it actually passes in parliament. And how we intend to do this is to, we would like to produce report. I think uh, in the past we have been doing a little bit reporting to the public, but it was, has been basically, uh, has been basically on past, um, past budgets. It is not on uh, recent ones. I think uh, we always get the budget from the past and then we try to go out and tell the public on how it has been, has been um, it has the process and all this. And usually the information we give to the public is outdated. We, uh, unfortunately in Vanuatu, NGOs and the public are not part of the government process in, in uh, dealing with, in uh, trying to approve budgets in parliament. The, the process of budget uh, for the government is basically done by the government. And the only time the public is aware of the, parliament, of the budget that is passed is when it is passed in parliament and it is made into a public document. I think what the Van Gogh and its uh, partners would like to do is to, uh, is to assist the Ombudsman and the Auditor General and with pools of uh, local and regional experts to independently evaluate and produce reports on certain government expenditures that have been identified. But why we say this is that now and then, the government would usually come up with a certain issue that it has with uh, budget that has been spent. But it is basically uh, politically motivated. It is uh, done by a particular minister in the past, a decision has been made to spend certain budget and then the next government which comes in, he sees the budget uh, that has been spent and then he, they come up with a commission of inquiry and to investigate. And I would like to see that change. I would like to see that if there is a commission of inquiry that is being carried out, it is not just a report that is done and produced and people know about it, but what happens to the report? Is it just shelved? And working with the Ombudsman, the Ombudsman is the mandate, has the mandate to investigate and prosecute people if they break the law. The Auditor General sits in the Parliamentary Accounts Committee in Parliament, and that is where he has the, he has the mandate in order to look at all the budgets within the government. And that actually, if working alongside them, that will enable us to, uh, have this pool of people where if a report is produced and uh, it is made into parliament, then, then we could actually have the report and also ensure what law is broken so that whoever is wrong is held responsible. It's because I have seen in the past up until my, today is that most reports are done, but nobody is held accountable. People say that there is something wrong, but there is nothing actually done. And that is how I want to see uh, Van Gogh come out in the future. I think apart from we talking about parliament, I think we also have to mention also that, well, the parliament passes the budget and then it is the public servants who actually go out and actually implement. I think um, to be more, to hold the people in parliament accountable. They bust the budget, but the actual spending of the budget is done by the public servants. And then um, I think uh, decisions that are made in the public, in, in, by the public servants, I think uh, as an NGO, we should be able to be able to evaluate those expenditure. And to if there is any concern by the public on certain projects or certain spending, um, we should be able to have the resources to actually 
do an independent report to actually verify whether the concerns of the public is is genuine or is it just a misunderstanding or lack of in the information that has been given to uh, that uh, the public has been passing chat because I have found out that um, in uh, Vanuatu uh, most times the public uh, uh, hardly um, looks at the facts but uh, they tend to deal a lot with uh, speculations and that was what makes it very difficult is that um, in the end when you take what is the actual fact and you tell people people are already corrupted with the speculations and they think that whatever you present as fact is not the actual truth. And uh, I like the way uh, James has been talking about what how they hold people accountable. I think uh, with Vanuatu to hold the parliaments accountable to their duties in parliament, uh, I think uh, we have to use the rights to information that we actually have in parliament at the moment and that uh, uh, to enable the parliament to give us that information. I think uh, that would make uh, Vanuatu, uh, the NGOs much more um, be able to provide the report that the people want to see whether the people they elect into parliament are actually going there to do what they were elected to do or are they just uh, ticking the attendance seats and not attending I think there is a lot that uh, Van Gogh has to do. And I am very grateful for this uh, webinar. I think it has opened uh, my eyes to a lot more than the NGO can do and hold people in parliament that we vote for. I can Accountable. I think um, uh, what uh, Van Gogh can actually do is awareness, awareness to the, uh, the uh, awareness to the public, awareness to the public, and to ensure that um, uh, what the government passes into budget is uh, is translated to the people. I think one thing people in the, that is uh, lacking that the NGOs need to explain to the, to the public and also is that the amount of money that is passed in parliament each year is not what the, the like people always think that it is the budget that is passed for development. I think people, I think that is one thing that has been has been lacking on the NGO to actually tell the people that uh, most of the time what the government actually passes is expenditure and spending on this expenditure they create services that the public can actually um, take advantage of to create businesses that uh, they can actually help to help the economy economically. I think um, that is one thing that the I I I have to say that Van Gogh is uh, has a lot more to do and then with uh, creating uh, with this with these two years I think uh, Van Gogh is has is trying to find its footing and I think um, the government has also uh, changed a lot of his act to put uh, Van Gogh within each. Uh, it's a board, a board, and that has enabled Van Gogh to have a voice in each of the government uh, with policies. And I think, I think um, what we need to do as Van Gogh at the moment is to actually strengthen now, uh, to have the procedures in place so that we can hold the government much more accountable with its budget and also to ensure that what we do is effective and has results. Uh, by using local and regional experts and having the resources to carry out the report that is that is independent and is credible so that when it is taken up uh, by the government to see where it has gone wrong, it can take it and trust it that it has come from uh, independently and it has is done by 
experts who know what they're doing. And with that, um, I thank you very much uh, for allowing me the time to share what Van Gogh has done to hold the government accountable in Vanuatu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nasak, and thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, we thank you so much for your time. We'd also like to thank our other two speakers, Mr. James Khan and Ms. Lucia Langilebo. Now we have 30 minutes for a question and answer session, and I'd like to encourage all of you to use this opportunity to answer um, our panelists' questions, um, or if you'd like them to elaborate on something that they might have spoken about a little bit earlier. Now, if there's a specific person that you'd like to address this question to, please indicate so, or otherwise you may let the panelists know that it's an open question to all three of them. Now, with that being said, there was a question that was raised during the course of Mr. Khan's presentation from Barbara Ruin. Uh, Mr. Khan, I know that you already answered it in the question and answer session, but I was hoping that for the benefit of those people who weren't able to see your answer a little later on, if you could maybe share your, your answers with the group. Now, her questions were, and she had two of them, were the efforts part of the Taiwan OGP implementation of the National Action Plan? And her second question was, what is the membership criteria and process for parliamentary monitoring organizations? Okay, uh, thank you, Amelia. Uh, thank you for this. <laughs> And these two questions are very crucial and important. Um, so for Taiwan's OGP action plan actually is primarily initiated by the civil society in Taiwan. And we directly go to talk to our uh, chairman and then parliamentaries. So it's separate for the uh, open government and open parliament. It's actually the two action plan. So for the parliament side, because CCW, we have very extensive monitoring experience. So we combine with the uh, open cultures, like open, the open actually means open data format. So we combine these two idea, monitoring and open data. So this will facil uh, facilitate Taiwan civil society uh, those who understand the parliaments, what is the most important information that did not uh, release or is in their documents hard to uh, reach out, like it's in the PDF forums, it's hard to use because you can only see the pictures. You cannot use in them for uh, text mining. So uh, combine these two ideas, we urge the parliament uh, to release more data from open source or some monitoring site we cannot reach out by this OGP action plan. So far, uh, we have the first OGP action plan for 2020 to 2024, the four years term. So right now is the, the last, last uh, I think the last six months. But right now we already down more than 80%. But the 20% we left, we have to negotiate with the MPs and the caucus right now. So we have some struggled, but we're still trying to figure that. But actually we've done a lot of efforts about open the data and open the forum. And the question number two, uh, I will say everyone or anyone or any organizations, you can start monitoring right now. But however, because it should be uh, a boy about the self, uh, the conflict of interest and also the principle of the self-discipline. So for CCW's example, if someone is currently uh, hold a positions in the political party, which party has the representative in the parliament we think that is a contract a conflict in the interest. And also you are the relative with the MPs or you are the uh, subordinate, like you are the staff, no matter in the parliament or in her family or in the business part, anyone, you are the staff of the MPs. So you are not, actually you can monitoring, but we cannot understand what you are 
side. So we avoid these kind of members to join our evaluations to avoid the principle of the conflict of interest. Also, uh, this is not in the chat room. Uh, yes, how to run the organization is very important. It's about the money, the, found, uh, the, the funding. So we will uh, use the funding for the society uh, about the Taiwan's domestic, but from donations, we cannot accept any donation from the party, from the parliament. Even they agree our idea, they want to support us, we cannot say yes, because there will be the interest conflict. So this is my uh, response. Everyone can monitor it, but if you want to go the public report, you want to announce the report, make sure there's no interest conflict. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. Now I have a question for, for Lucia. Um, we've heard from, uh, from you and from both James and William on how important it is that citizens are engaged when it comes to governments and government policies. Um, in your experience, in your opinion, what do you think would be the way forward in terms of the new parliamentarians in Fiji when it comes to strengthening citizens' engagement? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Amelia. Uh, I believe there's a, a few factors that uh, the new parliamentarians uh, in Fiji need to take on board, especially from lessons learned in the past years, um, having a lack of engagement with citizens, having a lack of awareness on what is actually being experienced on the ground. Um, and, and I say that um, with, uh, with knowledge received and information received from members of uh, the communities um, uh, in places where CCF has worked in. So I, one of, uh, one recommendation would be to uh, engage more with CSOs and community leaders in terms of you know, sharing and equipping them with knowledge on parliamentary processes um, and skills for uh, effective and diplomatic advocacy. Um, and through these avenues, uh, CSOs and community leaders can then assist parliamentarians uh, to inform other communities, other uh, citizens, uh, on how best that they how best they can engage with parliamentarians, uh, as I have shared before, one of the ways CCF did this was through the um, parliamentary advocacy engagement um, workshops. Uh, and as I have mentioned before, there's still a greater need on the ground for more uh, information sessions such as these. Uh, it's also important for you know, projects such as um, the one that CCF had uh, implemented. It's important uh, to discuss with implementing partners on challenges that may be faced uh, when trying to uh, carry out activities, when trying to, uh, when trying to work with parliamentarians. Um, because we have to remember that the focus is to uh, build the capacity of citizens, build the capacity of uh, communities uh, to understand parliamentary processes better, to understand why it is important for them to engage with, uh, with parliamentarians. Uh, parliamentarians, we would encourage parliamentarians to also, um, uh, to also make engagements more accessible. Uh, one example could be the parliamentary standing committees. Um, I, we have not seen a lot of advocacy in terms of the purpose of these um, parliamentary standing committees and how members of the public can actually, uh, can actually participate in consultations. You know, right down to the language that you can use when you are participating in these consultations. A lot of the times, these um, engagement processes tend to be, um, how do I say this, tend to 
scare people because of how formal they may seem. Um, and so, you know, communities have these precon uh, preconceived ideas that, you know, okay, uh, these consultations are not for me. Maybe it's just best that our community leaders uh, attend it and speak on our behalf. When really, you know, it's it's a public consultation. Anyone and everyone can attend and participate in it. Um, so parliamentarians really need to work on making these engagements more accessible and more known to the public uh, in various uh, languages, various uh, venues, um, and various modes as well. Uh, we, I also want to share uh, one of our excursions we had to um, the New Zealand Parliament uh, a few years back, and it was very uh, encouraging on how they carry out their consultations. Uh, they're very welcoming on how creative uh, members of the public can um, can make submissions to these standing committees. Uh, we were told that they've received uh, submissions from members of the public in so far as a poem being read, in so far as artwork being shared. Uh, you know, not everyone can speak in the same language as parliamentarians do on a daily basis. So it's really important for parliamentarians to to extend and expand uh, how they engage with members of the public. I, I, I hope um, I've made sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, now we have another uh, a question that's been posed in our question and answer forum, and it's from Ratu Eroni Lenduadina. Now, um, because this wasn't posed to one particular person, um, I'm assuming that this is this is a question that's being posed to all three of you. So um, the question was, institutionalizing discrimination, laws criminalizing homosexuality, reinforce systematic disadvantage of lesbians, gay men, and bisexual people, and against transgender people who may be heterosexual, and act as an official incitement to, or justification for violence against them, whether they're in custody, in prison, on the street, or in the home. Now they're interested to know from your perspectives, if there has been any shifts in this area, and if there has been any monitoring from your respective organizations on ensuring each country's responsibility to the protection and safety of all its citizens. As there are still five countries within our region that still decriminalize gender diverse people and relations. Um, now Lucia, since you were the last one to answer a question, I'm going to ask if you could ask, answer this question first. And then maybe James, we can get your thoughts before we allow William to answer last, if that's okay. Um, thank you, Amelia. Uh, for CCF, we, as I have shared before, we do continue to monitor um, the protection of human rights, um, specifically in terms of uh, discrimination. Uh, as mentioned by um, uh, Ms. Rhonda. Uh, and this is done through our Universal Periodic uh, Review Working Group um, locally, which Rainbow Pride um, Foundation is a member of. Uh, but it is also an important area that uh, CCF would need to specifically hone into in terms of our parliamentary monitoring. Uh, we've, also, um, we've also been made aware by some of our partners um, that they are carrying out uh, research in this area in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, gender discrimination, in terms of uh, discriminating marginalized members of marginalized communities. Um, but yes, I mean, like I've said, it's it's a really important area that uh, CCF would need to take on board in terms of parliamentary monitoring. Um, and I guess I, I'd leave it at that. And I hope to discuss more on this with you, uh, Ms. Rhonda, um, so that we can get works underway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Sorry, uh, James, if I could please get your thoughts on that now. Okay. 
uh, for these questions, uh, for I just explain our indicators. Actually, this kind of law uh, is violated with the human right, right? So if CCW saw these actions uh, or the proposal, the bill was sent into the parliament, actually we'll uh, have a press conference to say this is violated with the human rights. For, so right now in Taiwan, actually this act didn't not exist. They, we have a very strong uh, LGBT sense for our law right now, but still it's not very common or it's, uh, actually uh, uh, it's realized people in Taiwan environment have this kind of sense. But no matter for our organization, because we are the parliament watching organization, right? Monitoring organizations, we don't, we cannot understanding every topic of the issue happen right now. But for our expected is we will invite the organizations who are the expert in this area. For example, this kind of issue is really happened in our parliament. We will have, uh, have a press conference and we will invite the representative from LGBT or the NGO from the women for uh, just this kind of organizations join our press conference. We can say what's happening in parliament right now. And then we will leave the microphone to them. They can explain more what this act happened, what this act, if the past, what the results. So for me, we have a many kind of this experience. We are the monetary organizations. When we saw some act is appropriate, it's violated with the human rights. We will invite another NGO to join us. So because CCW is not one organization, actually we have 48 members in our pie. So we will invite different areas, expert representative or organization to share the experience for environment, for the LGBT, for the woman, for the child, many kinds of the issue. So we don't have to be the expert for every issue, but we can be the platform. We can be the, the, the one, invite everyone to discussions, their opinion during the parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. Um, William, would you? Is there anything that you'd like to contribute to this conversation? Um, I would like to say I would like to say this that uh, Vango, as a the umbrella organization for NGOs within the country, is partner to the government, and it's partner to the government to ensure that each NGO actually tries to implement the government policies and try to fill the gap which the government can. And on this particular topic, I would have to say that uh, within my country at the moment, Vanuatu, there are important topics which we are dealing with, um, like um, uh, climate change, women, uh, gender, uh, people with uh, disability, and we're also looking at employment for Vanuatu. I think uh, people, uh, 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 I would like to say that when this issue becomes of importance to the country, then I believe that uh, my country will be, I uh, would put it on as, a, as an agenda and talk about it. And the NGO has people of this uh, uh, with them. And we will uh, ensure that their rights as, as, uh, as Ni Vanuatu, is looked at. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. Okay, so it is now um, roughly 20 past one. Is there anyone who has um, a question that they'd like to share to the chat group or to the question and answer portal? All right, if not, I'd um, like to pose one last question uh, to the panelists. Now, uh, Mr. Mr. Khan, um, James, you shared on a slide earlier that democracy is not just about voting on election day, but about fulfilling civic responsibilities every day. And that to achieve this goal, you developed an evaluation system. 
Now, in your experience, what were some of the learnings that you found during um, the founding of the systems that may be helpful to people like William and to others in the region who'd like to start a system or kind of start a kind of watch system like this in their countries? Okay, so from our experience, if you say something, someone is bad, it's very dangerous. So you will be challenged. Even though we are saying they are bad, just uh, in the name of observed list, it's a challenge, but it can wear the public. So in our experience, when we first time to give them this kind of title, uh, CCW, our organization just be sued by those MPs, but actually they cannot so succeeds because all the information is from the parliament. We did not create any information. But uh, on the other side, if you give the rewards to the MPs, they, were, they are very happy to get the rewards and they will focus on your indicators and do the right things in the right directions. So from my opinion, each country have different situations, different environments especially the parliaments, what kind of information you can get, it's very different. So I think without a uh, sufficient resource right now, just make sure the attendance, uh, interpolations, or the budget or the proposal of the bills, if you can calculate this quantitative data, then you can first time have the score. It's very easy. For some organizations in Taiwan, <clears throat> they are also monitoring. They don't do a lot of work like CCW do, but they also pub publish the quantitative data. I think only part-time jobs you can find uh, from the students of the university, they can calculate by uh, for, for your organizations and then you can publish. So it's not spend a lot of money. You don't have the big budget but it's a first step that people aware that uh, we can do this monitoring and we can have this method, we can have these tools. And after first step, we can discussions which direction we want our MPs go. So you can add more indicators. That, that is why CCDF happened. Only 10 indicators in the first time. And right now there's a 51, thank you. Thank you so much, James. And thank you everyone for your time today, especially to our panelists and for those who tuned in to be here, um, especially Ms. Langilevu and Ms. Nawak for your wonderful insights. Now I'm going to give you all a few seconds to gather your thoughts so that you can deliver your closing remarks. But while you do so, just a statement from International Idea that we are talking about individual ordinary citizens monitoring um, rather but rather an organized one, like, sorry, that we are not talking about individual ordinary citizens monitoring, but rather an organized one like CCW. I hope that clarifies. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Mr. William Nowak to please give his closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much for International Idea to allow Van Gogh to actually as chairman to actually put forward. I think uh, on this particular topic, I would have to say that as organizations uh, who, uh, who take the voices of uh, the citizens, I think we have a big responsibility. And then I would have to say the insight that, have, uh, that I have received from both James and my colleague from Fiji, I think it actually gives us um, Van Gogh an idea on where it wants to go in its directions to hold its parliaments uh, much more parliamentarians more accountable. I think um, it is a duty of the civil society to hold our the people we vote into parliament to ensure that uh, they are accountable to the citizens that actually vote them in. And I know that uh, Van Gogh has a lot more work to do and. I am glad that organizations like International Idea and James and Biango and all the others around the regions are there to help us 
and I'm looking forward to a very good year. And I, um, I will reach out for any assistance to actually help Van Gogh move in the directions where we can be proud of what they do with her, with her in helping to monitor the parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nassak. We wish you and Van Gogh all the very best for the future. We look forward to hearing great things from you and your organization. Uh, Ms. Langilevo, if I may, would you like to give your closing remarks now? Thank you, Amelia. Um, just a few words from us at CCF. Um, from implementing that project on parliamentary um, support. Uh, it's important for us to understand uh, the, current, uh, the current knowledge uh, that citizens have on parliamentary processes. So, uh, you know, works such as uh, those carried out by, uh, by James Cannon, uh, his organization is really important, and it's something that um, I believe organizations in the country would benefit from. Uh, and we look forward to, um, uh, to, to more discussions with uh, James Khan uh, in the future, as well as learning from the experiences of our colleague, uh, William Nasak, and, you know, just absorbing the lessons learned from these, uh, these organizations and how best that could also uh, maybe work in Fiji. Um, also, we'd like to um, highlight that implementing a parliamentary monitoring or support projects in Fiji um, is for you know, the purpose of encouraging CSOs and uh, members of the public in engaging with parliamentarians and it would be more meaningful and effective if that is done in collaboration with parliament as an institution as well as members of the parliament there's still a lot of work needed on the ground um, as ccf has seen from our community engagements our community workshops uh, and the responses that we've received through this project so uh, we hope to do more work in this area Naka. Thank you very much, Ms. Langilevu, for your time today. We sincerely appreciate all the information and the knowledge that you shared with us. And we'd like to thank you as well for all of the work that you and CCF do. Um, uh, thank you very much. And we can't wait to see the great work that you and your organization will be doing for the future. Uh, Mr. Khan, if I could please ask you for your closing remarks now. Sorry, uh, uh, this is, I want to say it's very honored and have a great learning from the CCF and Ben Goats. Thank you, your sharing. And actually we are looking forward to more uh, participation, uh, participation from, the, uh, from your regions. So it's an honor to have a more dialogue with you, CCF and the Ben Goats in the futures. So actually we have an idea and it's already realized. Uh, we will have a cooperation with the uh, PMO in Argentina. We will have a workshop online started from the September to this end of the year. So we understand that the nature of the parliamentary because the different about the government system, electoral system, political environment but we believe that principle remain is the same. It's the universal value like openness, transparency, accountability, integrity. So we want to collaborations. Oh, the interesting group, you don't have to be the parliamentary organizations. Every CSO or every individual persons, you have this interesting about the parliament monitoring. You want to start up, you want to the first step, uh, please join us. We will announce the uh, how to apply to join this network, to join this workshop. And then we will have an in-person meeting. I think it's the end of the year, maybe, maybe not in Taiwan, maybe in the Bangkok or in the Jakarta. So we can see each other and try to find 
each country is the suitable monitoring indicators, monitoring weight. And in 2024, we can have another forum to share our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. And thank you very much for the incredible work that you're doing. It's been a wonderful learning experience and we look forward to the work that you're, that you're doing being a catalyst for other countries to kind of do the same. Now, I know that I already thanked our panelists, but again, on behalf of International Idea Fiji and International Idea Asia and the Pacific's regional offices, we'd like to thank all of our speakers and especially you, our audience, for joining this live event. It is our sincere hope that through the discussions today that you, that we have gained knowledge about the issues in the region. Now, if you've enjoyed this webinar, then we'd like to strongly encourage you to look out for the dates of our next webinar so that, we're, that we can kind of participate and learn and grow together. Until then, from International Idea of Fiji and the team, Vinakavak Levu in Nisa Modemanda.